The year 2022 is coming to a close. It had a lot to talk about in sports. And who better to break it down than us this week on Iceman and Coach. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Iceman and Coach Sports Show. It is the last episode of the year. It's amazing to say that when this show came back in July sometime and we rebranded to Iceman and Coach, little did we think that this year would fly by. The NFL season was upon us. College football was starting up. And here we are. We are recording on December 27th. So that means there are four days to go in the calendar year of our Lord, 2022. And it's amazing. I feel like time always flies by. But I will say this. The last episode of the year, we finally, finally have the coach back after a couple of monologues and a great appearance by my friends Julia and Noel last week to talk about some World Cup, which I know coach doesn't care about. So coach, it's great to see you again, man. And welcome back. It's great to have you back for the last episode of the year. Ice, man. It's, uh, it's really nice to be back. And uh, I do appreciate uh, you uh, monologuing like the pro that you are. And uh our friends last week filling in with a little World Cup talk. And I wouldn't say that I don't care at all about the World Cup. It's certainly not at the top of my list, but I do respect what it is. And I try to uh, take in a little bit of it when it's happening because I do know that it's a pretty significant event um, in the world of sports. Uh, coming off a wonderful holiday weekend with Christmas, I'd like to know uh, how was uh, the Christmas holiday for the Ice family? You know, it's always good. As you know, James has been sick quite a bit. That's my son, for those of you listening for the first time. So he came down with croup a few days beforehand, which is pretty common for those daycare folks. And he recovered quite nicely. My in-laws came into town because we ended up not going to see my folks for a litany of reasons. And I think they really, really enjoyed it. He's going to be three years old in March. He really kind of got into the Christmas spirit this year, although some of the nuances of it really escaped him. And I mean, hey, Santa's coming on this one day. And then the next day you have to wait a whole nother year. So the next day he woke up and said, is Santa here again? And we're like, it doesn't really work that way, big guy. But it was a nice day. He he took him three hours to open his gifts. Can you believe that? That's crazy. You know, it's funny. It took uh, it took our little guy about that long, too, because he would just get so occupied, right, with whatever he opened. And it's like, man, you still got like 15 15- <laughs> things left to open my man come on yep that's exactly what happened when we came downstairs we set up and everything and we had set up the night before of course but we had a camera set up just to get his reaction see how it would go and one of the things that was out was this matchbox track and he saw it because it was not um it was not wrapped and so he played with that for the first 30 minutes we couldn't get him to open a gift so it was kind of one of those and then he would open up one thing and say oh i want to play with this be preoccupied for another 30 minutes and the cycle went on it was about a little afternoon by the time he opened up all of his gifts because he actually woke up at eight o'clock which i'm sure your kids were up at 5 30 in the morning no you know what's amazing is that i think it was it was eight or eight thirty when our kids got up i was uh, I was relieved, you know, because I was up a little late the night before we went, uh, you know, about a half hour away, just down the road from where I'm sitting right now, but a half hour away from uh, our house to my uncle's for our Christmas Eve festivities. And so, yeah, it was a little late night getting home. And then obviously, uh, you know, all the duties that come along with being a parent on Christmas Eve had to take place. And so it was a little late and I was definitely relieved. Uh, very happy that the kids slept in um, till eight or so. It was really nice. It is a pleasant surprise. I'm sure that mom on borrowed time with that kind of a thing, but I don't know. It was a nice, relaxing morning. We have a couple of traditions that we do. My wife always makes cinnamon rolls, homemade, the whole deal. It's a Paula Deen recipe, so obviously there's a crap ton of butter. You can't go wrong with that. And actually, we drink that Christmas coffee that I sent you as a little pre-Christmas gift, which I hope that you're still enjoying. And so we do kind of that sort of thing. And throughout the day, it's very much a relaxing day. Everybody kind of gets into their gifts, whatever the case may be, as Ryan would say. And that's kind of it. This year, I made baked CD, kind of a family recipe. We went very low key the night before on Christmas Eve. It was finger food, some taquitos, some puff pastry stuff. Very, very simple. And that's kind of what it has become for us because we don't have family in the area that we travel to so it's really whatever we make of it but we try to stick to most of the traditions and overall it was a really really good weekend i'm off this whole week so that's always nice and looking to end the year on a good note yeah absolutely um you know it was uh there's something to be said you know while 
while maybe uh, at moments you you maybe wish family was a little closer, there's also something to be said for the peace <laughs> that comes with uh, being able to kind of hunker down with your immediate family and enjoy that time together. Uh, because there's definitely some stress that comes with uh, traveling to to see family, and then you know, in my case, just a lot of young kids. And I once upon a time, right, I was one of them. Uh, now I'm just a grouchy old man that's ready to pull a hair I have left out. Uh, why these kids just fight over toys and everything else. But I mean, all being said, it was a lot of fun to see them enjoy themselves. It's such a great time for me because I love gift giving. And the last few years with having a newborn at home and the pandemic and everything, I just didn't get to get into the spirit of Christmas and the spirit of giving the way that I usually do. And I know last year I felt like I really dropped the ball because, and you're married, you know how moms are. They take care of so much stuff that we husbands just don't even realize. And in the background of it, it's amazing the things that if our wives just left, what we would have to take care of and usurp. And it's not as if we can't do it. So many things go by the wayside in terms of, or so many things go unsaid that we don't realize. And so I like to always give a lot of gifts, not like a a ton of gifts and overbearing amount of gifts, but I like to make sure my wife feels special on that day. And that's because that's the way I am. And my son is going to get that same treatment and it's not going to be spoiled for the sake of being spoiled. It's just kind of a, I want you to feel special to let you know if you don't already know how cherished you are for this family throughout the year and it's the time to do it. And she kind of wants for nothing. She never asks for anything. And so I take it upon myself to to try and do that. And this year I was able to do that because I was a little more locked in on it. So it gave me a good feeling. And I know it's not about that, but it just, it, it was nice to make her feel special. And, you know, it was a good year. It really was. And I know that 2022 probably had some ups and downs for the both of us, but I would say that overall, us starting the show and, and you know, having this friendship, I really think that, you know, that was one of the highlights of the year for me. No, I couldn't agree more. It's really been a pleasant surprise. And a surprise maybe isn't the word because, you know, it didn't take long to realize, you know, we had some things in common in terms of obviously sports interests and things beyond that as we've we've learned through conversation. But uh, really, it's, it's kind of incredible how this whole podcasting thing, right, in general can just serve as a, a catalyst to bring people together. And, and that's probably been my favorite part about about it whether it's on this show or doing the show with ryan um and some of the folks we've met through that is the people that it's brought into uh to my life and uh it's it's been really meaningful yeah and it's it's a surprise like i guess when i started this whole venture i i didn't think about meeting friends i kind of thought about what the show would, would be about and about content creation all that kind of stuff but Honestly, I think you're right. The people that we have met, you guys at Pub Time have been part of that for sure. I mean, we've we've shared appearances on our respective shows and all that. But at the end of the day, it's about the people. And I just really appreciate the fact that we've been able to connect and, and talk about something that we like. And I think we've also connected on a personal level outside of the show. But the show is obviously a catalyst for that. But 2022 was packed with stuff, my man, and sports has a lot. We don't get into nearly as much that happens in sports on this show because we only have an hour every week and it's impossible to get to everything. We're not experts on every sport. We generally tend to gravitate toward the sports we like, but a lot of stuff happens. So if it's cool with you, I kind of want to go through a little bit of a year in review. And I've made some notes here with some things that happen in football and some other sports that we've kind of touched on or maybe would appreciate. And so if you're cool with it, let's kind of go down the line and talk about some things that happened in 2022 in sports. No, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Why don't you start us off? All right. Well, let's start with the NFL because that's something that we're very familiar with and we talk about. It's going on right now. And I think what it makes the NFL interesting is the fact that its season goes from one year to the other. And so we forget a lot of the things that happen at the beginning of the calendar year, mainly the end of the regular season last year and some playoff stuff. But do you remember Antonio Brown famously, quote unquote, walking out on the Bucks in New York playing the Jets last year? Yes, I do remember that. And just thinking of how bizarre it all was and what a fall from grace uh, really that he experienced over uh, what really seemed like a very short period of time, you know, maybe uh, a year or two years, maybe in the calendar sense, I don't know, but uh, definitely a superior supreme talent 
and to see the way it all ended for him was very sad. It went from leaving the Steelers with all the drama that happened at the end of that. Mike Tomlin, not the kind of guy who wants to deal with that sort of drama. And he goes to Vegas. At the time, they were still in Oakland. Remember, Gruden was the coach there. And all the antics that happened, he didn't even make it to the game. Like, he never made it to week one for them. He ends up on the Patriots for that cup of coffee. Looks great. They end up having to cut him because of all this off the field stuff. And basically, he goes on the Bucks. He gets a Super Bowl ring, and it's just a matter of time before he breaks down. And I don't know if you've seen that he has been posting screenshots of messages between him and Tom Brady, I think trying to paint him in a bad light when everything in the message from Tom is like, hey, I'm trying to help you here. And he's looking even worse. He exposed himself in a pool, a public pool somewhere. You're right. The fall from grace has been, it, it feels like it's been precipitous for the last couple of years, but maybe we were just overtaken by his talent and didn't see these kinds of things. But I know Ryan Clark of ESPN always talks about the second he got paid, he changed. Yeah, and that may have something to do with it. I know there's a lot of people that refer to the hit he took mm -hmm. uh, several years ago. He took that nasty hit and it almost seemed like uh, it, it knocked whatever screw or screws loose that might have been holding the last bit of his sanity together. Um, then it was kind of all downhill from there. And, uh, I, you know, if it was something like that, I could you almost sympathize with the guy a little bit. If that had nothing to do with it, and it, it is simply the fact that he got paid, that that is the perfect example of what I hate about professional sports. He's a very hard guy to root for. That's the way I've always felt about him. Another guy that I've never been able to root for is Big Ben and Steelers connection there. Obviously, they played with each other. And that stems back to a lot of the rape stuff that happened very early on in his career. He was... God, he was a shadow of what he was by the time he retired. He should have retired a couple of years ago. And him leaving, I didn't feel this sense of, of emotional attachment to it. Maybe it's a little bit different where you are because I know that he played in the Midwest and the Steelers are kind of inching over toward that Midwestern territory, so to speak. But he retired and I just thought, okay, my life is moving on. Yeah, I, I don't know that there was any sort of uh, sentimental... Um uh, effect when he retired for me personally. But one thing it did make me realize is I'm like, man, I am getting old because I remember when he ascended to being the starter in Pittsburgh. And to think that, man, I was like, it was probably one of the first times I've had that revelation of like, holy crap, I've just watched this guy's entire career in my lifetime here so far, or my adult life. It kind of made me, I, did, I remember I did reflect a little bit just on that, like, wow, you know, how he kind of, it was just sort of uh, almost a Tom Brady-esque rise, right? He came in due to injury. Um, the next thing you know, he goes on this crazy run and it was all, you know, the, the rest is history. But like you mentioned, the rape allegations and things like that, obviously there's there's a lot there to dislike and have an, and take issue with. And, and I'm definitely not here to diminish that at all. But I'll also go back to what I say too sometimes that, you know, if we're looking at pro athletes to be the example or the pinnacle of human decency, I think we're looking in the wrong places. But his career was one of not so much supreme talent. I, what's weird is I don't feel like he was that talented. He was just, it was almost, he just wouldn't quit, right? It was almost like a war of attrition. And he was so, I mean, he, he was so hard to bring down. He extended plays like crazy just because of how large and how physical he was. And it's basically he wore defenses down physically to the point where somebody ended up being open and he'd get the ball to them. Uh, it, it, he's kind of an anomaly, I think, as far as quarterbacks go in the traditional sense. And the only reason I really brought him up was because think about what would have happened if what happened to him rape allegations wise happened today. And we had the Deshaun Watson saga the last year or so, which we don't need to rehash that. We've certainly done that. He looks like shit, by the way. And I'm I'm not that sad about it on the football field. But what would have happened to Ben Roethlisberger if what happened then happened today? It's a fascinating thing to think about because our society has changed quite a bit. And I think that at the time, we probably brushed it under the rug a little bit or the NFL did a lot more than they would have today. And I think they would have been put between a rock and a hard place having to really come down on him from a business perspective. And I just think it's worth mentioning his retirement because the, the dichotomy between what happened to him and what's going to happen to Watson here. I, I don't know if Deshaun Watson is going to recover in his career. He took two years off, one by choice, the other one by suspension. And he does not look like a good quarterback right now. No, he does not. And you're right. It's easy to take, uh, take some pleasure in watching that a little bit because I uh, just kind of the way he's presented himself throughout the whole thing has made him, has made him um, unlikable in a lot of ways. 
you know, and that's what's funny is, you know, is there some weird double standard? I guess we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But you you are right, though, that if the big, big Ben uh, situation happened today, uh, it, it probably would have unfolded much differently. I just don't think we think about that enough in what would happen to some of these guys because there's so many guys that have come through the league that have had these kinds of troubles and they still got to play. And I think by winning, we tend to forget about those things. And so I, I was fascinated thinking about it when I, I forgot that Big Ben retired. I'll be honest, I forgot that he had retired this year. And so when I saw that, it was like, I guess I should mention it. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to say. And then I realized that, oh, I can compare him to the Deshaun Watson thing and we can talk that through. Some other things that happened in the NFL that I think were worth mentioning off the field, you had the Brian Flores lawsuit and all of that that came with it. Now, nothing really came to a head in terms of what we saw in the public. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for that to go. I know that he works for the Steelers and I know that the Dolphins have been through an interesting run here with Mike McDaniel and all of that kind of thing. But I remember when that lawsuit came out, there was a lot of questions as to whether it was a valid lawsuit. But I think what I've learned since then is the Miami Dolphins are just a crappily run organization. And I just think that it wasn't racism. I think that he just didn't want to do what they wanted him to do and they fired him. And I think that it was easy for him to latch on to the other stuff. And I'm sure there are systemic racism issues in the NFL, and he's the guy who seems to be out there about it. But I think that when it comes to the Dolphins, they wanted him to tank, and he said, I just can't do that. No, I think that there's a lot of truth to what you're saying there for sure. And it's really interesting how I've heard people say many, many times in sports that that winning cures all. Like winning makes a lot of things go away or at least be uh, swept under the rug. And it seems like that's sort of happening with the Dolphins. Their success has sort of put this whole story on the back burner. Uh, I, I can only imagine that if the Dolphins weren't having the success that they are, that we may be hearing um, more about this and uh, maybe how they made a mistake by doing this and then more diving into the reasons why they did it and so on. Um, but the fact that they are having some success and winning, and Mike McDaniel seems like a... He was a very likable person to this point. Uh, I think that's really helped them a lot from a PR uh, standpoint, for sure. Well, they're going to get a big PR hit here pretty soon because Tua is now in the concussion protocol again. And I think it calls to question, this is his third concussion this year, possibly his fourth. I, I don't know if he should be playing this year. And with the playoffs still imminent for this team, despite being on a four game losing streak, I will be interested to see how it's going to play out because right now the Dolphins have to make a really, really careful choice. And even if he's cleared, I would wonder to myself, what doctor is going to clear this guy? Because the stuff we saw at the beginning of the season, which we talked about when Alex was on with us, it was uncomfortable. And when I saw his play the other night against Green Bay, he looked terrible. The interceptions were terrible and it just looked like there's no way he's fully there. And I didn't even know that he had taken this hit. And now you see that he's in the concussion protocol. He actually self-diagnosed himself and said, hey, I'm in the protocol. I put myself in the protocol. And then you see the hit where he falls backwards, hits his head, and it all kind of makes sense. And the Dolphins are in a really tough place with this. Like they have got to figure out how to take care of this guy because it's a bad look. No, you're you're 100 right, and I. The tough part is they. Uh, you have if you're in the Dolphins' position, you have to rely on the opinions of medical professionals. And what do you do if you're the Dolphins? And two weeks from now, they say he's been cleared. I think if you're the Dolphins, you say I would like you to get a second opinion uh, from a different doctor, maybe a few physicians. And but at that point, if if he gets cl a clean bill of health. Um, from multiple physicians. I mean, how do you how do you justify not putting him on the field? Uh, that's the tough part there. Uh, at what point, like, where is that moral, ethical line? You know, I'm not really sure. And I think what worries me is finding a doctor that will clear him. I know that in professional wrestling, there have been a couple of wrestlers over the last five or six years who were not cleared by doctors because, and for everything that Vince McMahon is in terms of a, not great human being, head injuries are tough. And you sometimes have to save the athletes from themselves. And even though the wrestlers went out and got other doctors that would clear them, the WWE doctors wouldn't clear them and they didn't want them competing. And I think that erring on the side of caution for something like this is is the right move to do because you can go out and find a doctor that will 100% say, yeah, he's good to go. And that's what makes this so tough. Unless it's your boy, White Mike, 
I heard he uh, went to 10 different doctors trying to get cleared to play yeah. and still couldn't manage to do it, which is uh, is unbelievable. I mean, it's just crazy that he went to that extent. Speaking of which, do you remember that story about a month ago, the Bills defensive player who wasn't cleared to fly because of a rib injury, but he was cleared to play? So he drove to a game on the bus and it's like, how could he be cleared to play football, which is a combat sport, but he's not cleared to fly? If he's not cleared to fly, then he probably shouldn't play football. No, I agree. I, I remember that. I have no idea uh, what the scientific, whatever medical reason behind that is. I, I was pretty perplexed by it as well. And the other thing that happened was the Rams won the Super Bowl. They've been so bad this year that it's tough to remember that because Baker Mayfield is their quarterback, if you can believe it. By the way, you'll love this. My brother-in-law texted me on Christmas Day and said, if I told you in August that Christmas Day would be Russell Wilson versus Baker Mayfield and Baker Mayfield would be on the Rams and be the better quarterback by far, you would tell me I was full of crap. That's exactly what happened on Christmas Day, 51 to 14, and Nathaniel Hackett finally got fired. Broncos country let's ride i still think that's a mistake man i think he's taking the fall for for russ's uh ineptness or whatever it is but no man i'm actually i've always been a little bit of a baker mayfield fan and i know i've said before he's definitely like not the typical person that i would root for just because he's kind of arrogant and cocky and i'm not really here for that sort of thing most of the time there's just something about him i like he seems very human <laughs> um I, it just seems himself he seems genuine um as obnoxious and arrogant as he may be he may be he seems very genuine and i think that i like that about him and the fact that he's kind of undersized and just seems like he's there to compete man and do the best that he can i have a lot of respect for that and to see him have a little bit of success with the rams has been fun it may be the best place for him because mcveigh is a very good coach and he has taken some quarterbacks i mean jared goff got to a super bowl with him so you and you see what happens when he gets matt stafford they win a super bowl one year that's all it takes and baker mayfield is thrown to a bunch of guys nobody's ever heard of because they have so many injuries on that team it could be interesting if matt stafford ends up ending his career because of his elbow and baker mayfield gets a chance with some of these guys that are out there in a high-powered offense i mean throwing to cooper cup probably the best receiver he's thrown to in his entire career because i know everybody says obj but obj was well past his prime when he was with the browns and i will i will defend that take to my death because I truly believe that he is not the guy that was with the Giants. It's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. So I will also be excited about this, but let's switch to college football because a lot happened in college football, but I think the thing we have to start with that we never got to talk about was the passing of Mike Leach. And Mike Leach was obviously a guy we loved. I would consider him a friend of the show, even though he's never been on the show, but if he ever wanted to be and had the time, he would have been welcomed here with open arms. And it was a couple of weeks ago, it really took the sport world by storm it took the twitter world by storm and mike leach passed away because of a heart attack i believe it was and he was only what 61 years old probably one of the most likable guys in sports most genuine guys in sports and maybe some of the ways in which he conducted himself weren't hip to the times but you knew what you were going to get with him and if anything was true about him you could ask him literally any question and he would give you an answer it's just a sad state of affairs for college football to lose an actual character because there are very few of them left. No, I, I, I don't know that I can say it any better. And I think that it, one thing that really resonated with me after his passing was the outpouring of just positivity and stories and just genuine love and affection for Mike Leach and who he was. Um, I think if if someone had no idea who this guy is and you're like, hey, you know, you tell them what happened and like, well, who is this guy? You just, okay, just type his name into Twitter and just read for 20 minutes um, what people are saying about him. It, it, you would come away realizing that he was beloved by everyone in the world of football, especially. I mean, obviously people beyond that, but his peers had so much respect and admiration for him and what he'd done for the game. But most of all, the type of man that he was and who and what he stood for. You know, you, you'd have to search far and wide to find somebody that had anything negative to say about Mike Leach, uh, you know, especially, you know, after his passing. Yeah, we could talk about the piece of shit kid that tweeted about it, whatever, but I won't give him any more of my energy. It's just, it's absolutely a travesty. It's just a tragedy, I should say, because we really lost the gem. Uh, Mike Leach is an American treasure. 
and just what he brought to football. It was so refreshing because it was so unique in so many ways. I think what stands out to me is earlier this year, you and I made fun of Jimbo Fisher for his beef with Nick Saban talking about having the best class that money can buy. You remember all of that stuff? And Jimbo has obviously gotten his comeuppance because that team drastically underperformed this year. Obviously, Alabama is not in the playoff. But those two guys are nowhere near what Mike Leach was in terms of character. Like I would venture to say that Nick Saban obviously is loved by a lot of his players and is loved by his family and all that kind of stuff. Would we see the kind of outpouring? And I'm not, I'm not saying we wouldn't see an outpouring, but a lot of people I think would say greatest coach or great coach, you know, blah, blah, blah. But everybody was not saying how great of a coach Mike Leach was. I mean, they were but it was after saying that he was a world-class human being. And I don't know if the people that are coaching in college today are that. It's very business-like. And Mike, Mike Leach was a pirate in this corporate environment. That's what made him so great. And then I never realized how successful he was as a coach. I forgot that Texas Tech went to number one. That's incredible to me. Gardner Minshew, as you pointed out once, led the nation in passing. Couldn't get the win the other night, but obviously played for Mike Leach. And you just know that a lot of players love playing for him and would go to bat for him. And I don't know how many Alabama players would feel that way about Nick Saban. Maybe I don't understand it. I just don't think that it's the same thing. And I think that sports in general is losing characters like that. And we need more of them. Yeah. As soon as you started with your thought there, that's exactly what was coming to my mind when you started saying you know, Jimbo Fisher, Nick Saban. So as yeah, people would be saying, oh, the greatest college football coach ever just died. Not that, you know, this wonderful, amazing, incredibly unique human being uh, just, just passed away. Did I ever tell the phone, the coach's office phone call story? Yeah, where the guy okay. called, didn't know who he was and talked to him for an hour. Yeah, and he even called the guy back once he got disconnected. I mean, that's just, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, just what, what a gem. What a gem. And I think a coach coming up the ranks that has made a lot of headlines in a lot of ways was Deion Sanders, Coach Prime now. And we had talked a few weeks ago, probably the last time you are on the show, about how he's being courted by Colorado. Both of us didn't think he would go there. Boom, he's the Colorado head coach now. He's got a lot of character. And I think that even though he took this job, he still is the same guy. And I know there has been a lot of debate over whether he should have taken the job and what is he doing for HBCUs and all that. But I think that at the end of the day, a prominent black head coach getting a big power five job and continuing to move up the ladder is a great thing for the sport. Because one of the complaints that we hear is that there's not a lot of black head coaches. And in the NFL, that is that is very true. It doesn't really fit the percentage. And Coach Prime is already getting players to commit to Colorado. It's going to be harder. He's not going to be able to turn Colorado into an 11-0 program in three years, but he's got that personality. People want to play for him. And while he maybe won't get to the Mike Leach level in terms of personality, I do think that he is a character. And so we do have somebody to sort of take that mantle. Maybe Lane Kiffin is next. I don't know. But I know Coach Prime is there, and I'm excited to see what he can do at a school that hasn't amounted to anything in 20 years. Yeah, he's fortunate that there, you can only go up, right, from where they've been here lately. In regards to leaving Jackson State, you know, leaving an HBCU, I think that I don't. Yeah, I know there's there's some bitterness there, but I don't. I'm not sure why, because you would think that they would, like you mentioned, uh, with how I guess how I feel weird saying rare, but how rare it's been for a black coach to ascend to be the head coach of a Power Five football program. You think they'd be rooting for one of their own? They would see it as an overall net positive. Uh, so I think some of the um, backlash is a little undeserved and unnecessary. I do think that ultimately he's going to be successful. Now, what defines success? I don't know. I compete for conference championships, maybe uh, eventually, especially with you know USC and UCLA leaving. I know Oregon will probably be the the big bully on the block, but uh, you're you're right. He's doing a heck of a job recruiting. I, that doesn't surprise anyone. I don't think um, his biggest challenge is going to be to continue doing that and assembling a great staff. Uh, to handle the football side of it. And if he can manage that, look out. I mean, seriously, watch out. In the, in the, uh, the day and age of name, image, and likeness, and you got a guy like Coach Prime uh, at the helm, really, I think that anything's possible. I think he's taking this job at the perfect time with all the realignment stuff happening, expansion of the playoff, 
And if he can continue to recruit and get those players to elevate, who knows where Colorado will end up. But I believe you and I both had Colorado in our realigned NCAA, so they should still get a piece of that pie. And if they can become more successful, it it doesn't stand that Coach Prime would stay there. But I think they're in a very good position given everything that's on the horizon. And I'm excited for all of that because that expanded playoff, at least from a casual fan's perspective, is something I'm very much looking forward to. And I think it's going to make it a lot easier for him to be successful because if he comes out the gate, the team was what, 0-10 last year, whatever their record was. If they go 500 to make a bowl game in his first year, that right there will probably get more people to want to go there because that's instant success. I mean, you go from, I, I know that it's it's not a big jump to go from winless to having a couple of wins, but if you go from winless to bowl eligibility, that's a big step in the right direction. And I would like to think that a lot of young kids in high school, like, all right, this guy's successful. Not only is he fun to play with, but he's successful. And then you got boosters and you got money and that's how the train starts. And then he'll be the Auburn head coach. <laughs> right. And I tell you, he, uh, he flipped a, uh, a big time recruit that Notre Dame was excited about that was uh, they were waiting to get signed. And it just uh, that that to me, uh, in addition to some of the other big, uh, big, got big people he flipped and everything else. I was like, man, we better watch out. And uh, I'm excited about it, though. A lot of people don't like it. All the old stuffy boomers don't like it. I say bring it on, man. I think it's good for college football. So your dad doesn't like it, does he? You know, he hasn't been too overtly against it, but he he's more he more hates NIL. He hates name, image, and likeness because he thinks it's ruining college football. Sorry, Brad's dad. I didn't mean to take a shot at you. In case you're ever watching or listening, that was not meant to be a shot, but uh, maybe it was. I don't know. So a lot of other stuff happened in sports because I want to get to some things that are happening and get to our last crunch time of the year. A little bit of a short episode for us this year, but or this week, I should say. Aaron Judge breaking a home run record that nobody cared about. The Yankees didn't win the World Series. In my mind, hey, he had a great season, got paid a shitload of money. Didn't really matter. The World Cup happened, and I think it was very exciting for those of us that liked it. And if you want to listen to a breakdown of it, you can listen to last week's episode. We did a really good job. I learned a lot. One of my favorite stories of the year, man, St. Peter's during March Madness last year. That was one of the best stories in sports all year. I live for the underdogs, man. I'm a Cinderella guy through and through. And uh, so watching that happen was was wonderful. And of course, as a mid-major basketball fan, it always gives me hope that one day that may be my Bradley Braves. Would you go to the Final Four if the Bradley Braves made the Final Four? I almost think I'd have to, man, Like, because it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, you'd imagine. So I think I'd have to find a way to be there for sure. Have you ever been to the NCAA tournament, period? I have not. I had the opportunity... Uh, probably like 10 years ago, um, I had the opportunity to go to watch. I want to say it was like, it might have been the Sweet 16 Elite Eight round in Indianapolis. And uh, I, I I passed it up. I actually got to go and it was the Sweet 16 Elite Eight. It was here in D.C. I took a friend of mine. Tickets were like 500 bucks a piece. But you know what? It was a check off the old sports bucket list. I did not have a rooting interest. She was an Indiana grad, so she watched them. They lost to Syracuse, of course, in the Sweet 16 round. But it was great to actually be there and watch it and sort of get caught up in the excitement. So if Virginia Tech can ever get their shit together and actually get to a Final Four, I think you'd see me right there. So that was a great story. I think some other great stories were Albert Pujols' kind of It came out of nowhere, his race to 700 home runs. I mean, he had quite a few home runs to hit, and somehow it happened. And then, of course, for your boy Alex, uh, not a great outcome in the playoffs, but it was a great story in my mind. The passing of Bill Russell, one of the all-time greats in terms of basketball, and he had been a Boston legend, even though the stories of how he was treated when he was playing there were just horrific and unprecedented. And then you had retirements of some other big timers like Sue Bird, Serena Williams, Roger Federer. So a lot of that stuff happened. Those of you who love broadcasting, Vin Scully left us. He was in his 90s. He is the voice of so many iconic moments and somebody who, if you are a broadcaster or want to be a broadcaster, you're probably going to look at how he did it, being so genuine, being so real, but also being so great with his words. And a lot of other things happen. Alex Ovechkin getting to 800 goals. It's amazing because I always thought that Wayne Gretzky's goal record was never going to be broken. He has a legitimate chance. We've never talked about hockey before, but I think it's something that's amazing. And I think it's worth actually congratulating because it's an amazing achievement. And the last thing I want to say is the Astros winning the World Series. Dusty Baker, you talked about or we talked about great guys in sports. Dusty is a great one. And seeing him get that World Series ring, I think, was a great moment. Yeah, such a a really a a nice year in review. Some highs and some lows, right? Uh, You know, you have some of the the legends passing away. We have obviously the Brittany Griner thing uh, that obviously wasn't 
maybe a, a high point, uh, Vince Scully passing away. But you said, you know, Ovechkin getting 800 goals, you know, Pujols kind of taking his victory lap and getting to 700. Um, seeing, you know, Aaron Judge, you know, continue to be a breakout star and kind of maybe take over that position of being, you know, or maybe kind of be the anointed one in terms of the next uh, great player um, in baseball uh, that's going to chase down some of these, you know, huge records. Uh, seeing a legend like Coach K go. Yeah, lots of really great stories. I, I know we're in for another uh, great year of wonderful sports stories. And that's one of my favorite things about sports are the the human stories that come along with, for sure. I know you're a huge fan of that. So speaking of human stories, Jeff Saturday, LOL. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he came out of the gates hot, right? Um, but I'll say this. I mean, what's what's nice about it is that when he sat down at the press conference, he's like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to be good at this or not. I might be great at it. I might suck at it. Who knows? And if I do here in a few weeks, sorry, seven weeks, whatever, eight weeks, I'll tell Mr. Ursay thanks for the opportunity and I'll be on my way. And that's likely what's going to happen. That's what should happen. But I think the guy's giving it the old college try. They're considering him bringing him back. That was a headline that I read earlier this week. And he started Nick Foles at quarterback. I don't even understand how you guys still have these dudes in your quarterback room. Matt Ryan, Nick Foles. Unbelievable. You guys are going to get rust next year. I can feel it. Yeah, that's like the ghost of quarterbacks past. That's the that's the Colts quarterback. But I, I don't want to put it all on Jeff Saturday. I just find it funny because I remember he wins his first game. Everybody gets caught up in the madness. I'm a leader of men. I look him in the eye. All those cliches that he uses. And then when all is said and done, they just don't have the talent. And that's really what it's all about. The Colts just don't have the talent. They thankfully shut down Jonathan Taylor last week for the season because why bring him back for literally no reason? And they look like crap again against the Chargers, although the Chargers are kind of iffy. But anyway, the Colts have a lot of rebuilding to do. And I just, I, I put it there because we talked about it. I, I like Jeff Saturday as a dude. I don't think that he was gifted an opportunity in a way that was supposed to be malicious. In some way, I kind of feel like the Colts did it the right way instead of getting that stink on one of their other coaches who maybe could have the opportunity to either be head coach next year and have a clean slate. He gave it to Jeff Saturday, who shouldn't get the job and probably doesn't give a crap how bad he does. No, I mean, Jeff Saturday is one of the good ones at the end of the day. And he's obviously somebody that Jim Mercer trusts. And, you know, I think maybe Jim Mercer figured, you know what? I trust this guy. You know, I'm going to hand him the keys to the car, let him come in here and finish this thing out, not screw anything up. And then we'll we'll move on from there at the end of the season. Um, in terms of bringing him back, I will see. I don't know if I'm crazy about that idea. I mean, really, I, I don't care what any of the Colts' future plans are as long as they don't include Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson is very close to being the biggest bust in history of the draft because I think that his talent... Uh, Jamarcus Russell, I feel like, was a victim of just not working hard sometimes, but he was extremely talented. I think that Zach Wilson has been gifted an opportunity with a good team this year, and he squandered it. And his body language, his attitude is just piss poor. And if I'm a Jets fan, I don't want him anywhere near the team because that's kind of attitude. Like, he got benched the other day, and instead of going and being next to the coach, looking at film, hey, what have I done wrong? He goes and he slouches and sits there like some emo teenager. And that's not how you win in the NFL. It's not how you become a professional. No, he sucks. Moving on. Boom. Okay, so playoff picture right now. I think that the Buffalo Bills, Kansas City Chiefs, and Cincinnati Bengals are in a really good position in the AFC, but I want to bring up one point right now. The Jacksonville Jaguars are leading the AFC South at 7-8 and eight and would make the playoffs if the season ended today, and I think they have an excellent chance of making it, and boy, Urban Meyer sucks. Yeah, Urban Meyer sucks. I'm excited. They have young talent. Trevor Lawrence has looked okay. You know, Doug Peterson's got the boys going a little bit down there, and uh, I'm rooting for him. I mean, the Colts are out of it, so obviously I'm moved on to do other things and to see the young and talented Jaguars uh, make a run here at the end of the season. They're right up there for me with with my boys up in Detroit. Uh, I'd love to see them both find a way to squeeze into the playoffs. They squandered an opportunity by getting absolutely shellacked by Carolina and pulling the rug out of for all of Detroit. There's one playoff spot remaining in the AFC. Dolphins have it right now, but they play the Patriots this week. If Tua doesn't play, the Patriots get a win. Let's not talk about the Patriots and how they absolutely blew that game, not only against the Bengals, in epic fashion against the Raiders. And somehow nobody got fired or cut. I don't understand how this, how this is happening right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, unfortunately, I... 
kind of missed the way that one uh, that one wrapped up. You might have to fill me in sometime. But wait, whoa, 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 whoa! You didn't see it? No, I did not. You haven't seen it yet? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, I did. The freaking backwards pass, right? The Mac Jones, literally. That one is that what we're talking literally about? Literally going to be the definition or. Literally. It went to overtime, right? No, it didn't go to overtime because... No, but it would have. It would have if they just would have gotten tackled, correct? No, it would have gone to overtime had they not done a lateral, which wasn't part of the play call, and just took a fucking knee and just... It, whatever. Let's just not even... No, I saw. You're right. No, I did. I did see that. I'm and sorry. then this past week, they're down 22 to nothing to the Bengals at halftime, score 18 unanswered points. They have the ball inside the five-yard line, first and goal with a minute to go from Andre Stevenson, fumbles. Like I do, this is the difference between a good team and a bad team. This team should be nine and six and firmly in the playoffs. And now they have to play the Dolphins and the Bills to get in. And the Bills are 100% going to play their starters to crush the Patriots playoff hopes. And you know what? After 20 years of kicking their ass, they should. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what we call snatching a defeat from the jaws of victory. I know. And it doesn't even begin to describe how badly that Raiders game ended. It just didn't ever happen. The NFC, though, we thought it was going to be a one-trick pony, and we've got four legitimately good teams. And I think that San Francisco, despite all the hate that I gave them in terms of scoring points, man, Brock Purdy could win a Super Bowl with that offense, and they look like the most dangerous team in the league right now. They're peaking at the right time. The Eagles, maybe not, because if Jalen Hurts is hurt, is hurt, for lack of a better word, that team looks poised to be really, really good. I don't think the Vikings do, because they have won all or 11 straight or whatever it is by like three points or less, or one possession. Yeah, the, the 49ers, a lot of people were really high on them early in the year, and they weren't backing off, even when they kind of struggled a little bit. And I guess those people now are tooting the horn. Uh, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, right? I believe he was. I saw something the other day that he was, yeah, the absolute last person taken in the draft. He's relevant now. <laughs> no kidding, he sure is. And then, obviously, the Christian McCaffrey acquisition uh, was huge for them uh, midseason. And I'm happy for him that he's uh, landed somewhere where he can compete uh, for a Super Bowl or, you know, to play in a Super Bowl uh, again. That's really awesome. The Vikings, like you said, yeah, they've just been scraping by. I mean, it's become apparent that the uh, the Eagles are who we thought they were. <laughs> You know that they they're just gonna they're gonna regress to the mean. I think now that uh, they're they're starting quarterbacks out. Obviously, I'm being a little facetious here. The Cowboys, you know, look at the Cowboys, man. They've they've been solid. Don't look now, but uh, we'll see if they can put it together here in a, a couple weeks in the playoffs. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Giants and the Commanders are, are right there knocking on the door, aren't they? I think the Giants may actually have a better chance to make it. The Commanders have lost a couple games that they shouldn't have. They got blown out by the 49ers recently. But I think the NFC is going to be interesting to watch. But I feel the most confident about the 49ers right now because, again, it's about how you peak and how you get into the playoffs. And they look really good heading in. The other teams are coming in with some questions. The Cowboys beat the Eagles, but it took a 40-point effort to beat the backup quarterback for the Eagles. And the Eagles turned the ball over four times and scored 34 points so that is still a very good football team but I think that Jalen Hurts takes that team to a Super Bowl level so we will find out we have the NCAA college football playoff coming up Caleb Williams wins the Heisman I was kind of surprised by that a little bit because I thought it would be one of the guys that was in the playoff hunt and you know what man it's time for it one last time this year For the last time in 2022, it is time for Crunch Time, where Coach and I go back and forth, rat-a-tat-tat through 10 games on the slate. Coach, for the last time this year, are you ready? Iceman, I am ready. Fired up. First game, the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl, number 21, Notre Dame, facing number 19, South Carolina. Coming in, these teams have been ice cold. South Carolina coming off a big win over a rival. Notre Dame coming in, looking to make a statement for themselves. I just feel like Notre Dame coming in, they're going to really beat up South Carolina because I think South Carolina peaked at the end. Give me the Irish. Yeah, I think Notre Dame has some more uh, momentum heading into this game, but they are going to be missing their number one offensive weapon of Michael Mayer because he declared for the draft. They're going to be doing without a couple other players. South Carolina, though, has also had a lot of big time players opt out of this game. That being said, though, give me the Irish. <laughs> 
Moving on, the Capital One Orange Bowl, number six, Tennessee against number seven, Clemson. Neither of them will be playing with the quarterback that started for them the entire season. Hendon Hooker is out. He's declared for the NFL draft. DJ Uwe Ungule has transferred to Oregon State. I don't know much about these teams outside of that, but I feel like Tennessee being an SEC team actually has a little bit of an edge here. So give me the balls in a game that has no starting quarterback I've heard of. So I think that uh, Hendon Hooker means more to Tennessee success than DJ Man to Clemson success. I think at times there was actually a little bit of co- quarterback controversy in Clemson. And of course, their their quarterback's name, the backup's name, who's going to start this weekend escapes me. But I know he is, he's very talented. I'd be curious to see what he can do with a couple weeks of practice in a single proponent, opponent to prepare for. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I'll take Clemson. Go Tigers. <laughs> Number five, Alabama, and number nine, Kansas State in the All-State Sugar Bowl. This is not going to be close. Alabama is pissed they didn't get into the playoff. Nick Saban is going to sweep the leg of Kansas State. Give me roll tide. You know what? I think this is going to be the time I'm going to do it. I'm finally going to believe in the Wildcats of the Little Apple. Give me Kansas State. And in the first college football playoff game, the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, number four, Ohio State at number one, Georgia. Ohio State snuck in having lost to Michigan. That was the last time we saw them. Georgia trying to defend their national championship with a 29-year-old quarterback. Give me Stetson Bennett, the 16th, and the Georgia Bulldogs. No, I think that this is going to be Georgia, and I don't think it's even going to be close. I think Kirby Smart has a way of getting his guys up for these sorts of big games. I'll take the dogs. (laughs) In the very aptly named VRBO Fiesta Bowl, number three, TCU, and number two, Michigan, both coming in with a lot of talent. I just feel like Michigan playing a Big Ten schedule has a little bit more beef to their team. TCU is very talented with Max Duggan, but give me the Wolverines to make it to the championship game. I tell you what, I think this game's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, It wouldn't surprise me if it turns out to be a little bit of a shootout, the same way that the Big 12 championship game was, but I think ultimately in the end, Michigan outlasts them. Give me the Wolverines. Switching to the NFL, the Dolphins travel to New England to face the Patriots. This 100% has playoff implications. We're not sure if Tua is going to play. Mac Jones is going to play. I don't know how effectively. If Tua doesn't play, I feel like the Patriots have the edge here and will get a win to get them into the playoffs. Give me the Patriots. No, I think you're right. Uh, Going on the road to Foxborough, it's probably going to be nice and chilly. And Bill Belichick eats up young and experienced quarterbacks, which I imagine the Dolphins are going to be rolling out there. I don't know who their backup is, but I'll take the Pats. It's Teddy Bridgewater. The Panthers travel to Tampa to face the Bucks for what 100% is a divisional playoff implication game. The Bucks need it. The Panthers need it. But you know what? I'm kind of feeling the plucky Panthers here. Give me Sam Darnold to get a big win over Brady. You know, the uh, the NFC South is, is a piss poor division. I, I think this is going to be one of those where maybe whoever wins it is going to be sub 500 potentially. But I tell you what, I'll take Tom Brady. Uh, he's going to find a way to sneak into the playoffs. Give me the Bucks. <laughs> The New York Jets and the Seattle Seahawks face off in Seattle. Both teams need a win desperately to make the playoffs. Mike White is coming back. Geno Smith has regressed to the mean. Give me the Seahawks, though, in a home game. I'm with you, Matty Ice. I'll take White Mike in the Jets on the road. The Vikings travel to Green Bay to face the Packers, who were once left for dead, and now if they went out, can make the playoffs. Kirk Cousins has won a whole bunch of one-possession games. All of a sudden, the Packers seem to be rolling. The Packers generally tend to play a little bit weird against the Vikings, but in Green Bay, with that weather, give me Aaron Rodgers to get back to 500. I think this is uh, the Vikings and Kirk Cousins' chance to to finally maybe put some of these suspicions to bed about them being for real. I'm going to roll the dice here. I'm going to take the Vikings. And last, the Buffalo Bills travel to Cincinnati to face the Cincinnati Bengals. This game 100% could be for home field advantage. The Bengals have kept on winning, even without Jamar Chase. The Bills obviously keep winning. They have a lot of talent here. I feel like the Buffalo Bills are the better football team, even though it's a road game, even though I think that they're a road dog. Give me the Buffalo Bills to win and solidify themselves as a number one seed. I love Joe Burrow. I I just love the swagger he has. Uh, He just seems sort of that typical, you know, blue collar, hardworking type of guy. But he's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. and He plays the game that way. And I love it. Give me the Bengals. All right. That is our last crunch time for the year. A little bit of a sloppy affair. It's been a while since we've been in this groove. But don't you worry. The new year will bring upon us a little bit more professionalism and style. But it's always fun to get back to it. And it's always nice to have you on the other side, my man. No, oh, absolutely, man. That's one I'm going to miss, and I can't wait till uh, it rolls back around in the fall. I want to find something 
uh, something nice and unique and enthusiastic to take its place here over the next uh, six months. And that's how it means it is time for OTW, where Coach and I have our little bit of a personal flair here. We always start with Iceman's stat of the week. Coach, I assume you are familiar with the Atlanta Falcons? Yes, I believe I've heard of them. This is your random stat of the day. If In the Falcons' 56-year history, they have picked in the top 10 in the NFL draft 25 times. There's a chance this year they will also be picking in the top 10, which would be the 26th year. If that becomes the case, 51% of the time, Atlanta has had a first-round pick in its history. It's been a top 10 pick. That means they played a lot of bad football. That's incredible. And and yeah, to be... Uh, to not win any Super Bowls, right? And throughout the whole time of having all those high draft picks, that's unbelievable. They almost won one, didn't they? Almost. (laughs) And then big bad Tom Brady came along. My friends, it is time for Coach's Pick of the Week, the last pick of the week of this year. I do not remember what he picked the last time because it has been so long, but let's just assume that he lost and his record is still really, really bad. This is his last time to redeem himself. So, Coach, please bless us with your picketh of the week. Hear ye, hear ye, peasants and fans of the Iceman and Coach Sports Show. I come to you with the last but not the least greatest pick of the year. And I hate to do this. It tugs on my heartstrings greatly. But the Detroit Lions are taking on the Chicago Bears this week, and they are six-point favorites. But I don't sure, I'm not sure if you've watched this pesky Chicago Bears team and the young man that goes by the name of Justin Fields. Uh, but that dude can play some football. He's doing most of it by himself. And that's why I'll say I'm going to take Justin Fields plus six to cover the spread against the Detroit Lions. The Chicago Bears plus six over Motor City Dan Campbell and the Detroit Lions. So let it be written. And for the last time this year, so let it be done. And that brings us to the end of the episode, the last episode of 2022. There's still a lot that we're going to cover in January with the NFL playoffs, the college football playoff. You will see us all the way up until the Super Bowl, and then we will figure it out what it is that we are going to do after that. But sports is all encompassing. I have no doubt that we will be able to do it. Coach, I want to thank you for a wonderful year on this show, and I feel like we are building to something special. And you know what? We're just going to keep coming out with content, coming out with content, and the listeners will catch on and let us know what they like. So I want to thank you again for your friendship and for your professionalism on the show. Do you have any parting thoughts? As you stated earlier, Matty Ice, it's been a it's been a year of ups and downs, but that's how every year goes. And, um, you know, I choose uh, at the end of every year to sort of focus on all the good things. And uh, this show and you in particular um, are definitely high up on that list of uh, positive things that have happened this year. And I, I can't express to you enough how much I've enjoyed doing this show. I look forward to where it's going to go in the future um, as we continue to grow and evolve and build our chemistry together. And uh, I'd just like to wish all the listeners a happy new year and a safe new year. And uh, I hope you enjoy listening and that you come back for more um, absolutely fire content in 2023. Couldn't have said it better myself. Before we get you out of here, please support the Pub Time Podcast. That's where Brad likes to get into some other shenanigans in the podcasting world. They're always doing something fun and special. Ryan is a great co-host, so please check them out and support them. Please visit MattyIceMedia.com to buy our merch, support our podcast, all that good stuff. It means a lot. And from the coach and me, we wish you a happy and prosperous and safe new year. And we will see you all when the calendar flips. This is Iceman and Coach. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on the Iceman and Coach Sports Show are those of Matt Freights, Brad Powell, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. The Iceman and Coach Sports Show is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and Brad Powell and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.